Hi everyone, um, this video is going to discuss the lab titled Freezing Point Depression. And a Freezing Point Depression is a phenomenon that's observed when you take a small amount of a non-volatile solute. So non-volatile here means something that doesn't evaporate very easily, things like salt or sugar, uh, that type of solids, they don't um, evaporate at room temperature. So if you take a small amount of a salt, for example, and you dissolve it in a volatile solvent, which is something that uh, a compound or a liquid that does evaporate relatively easily, for example, water would be considered a relatively volatile solvent, uh, ethanol, and anything that basically has a boiling point uh, of about 100 degrees or below, those are volatile solvents. If you take a small amount of salt or sugar and dissolve it in water, for example, it turns out that we will see that the freezing point of the solution, which is the uh, temperature at which the liquid changes to solid, will actually go down. This is what is referred to as freezing point depression. So freezing point is being depressed. In other words, it goes down. Um, for example, for uh, this is commonly done in um, areas where snow occurs. A lot of times what you see is you have roads, and then when temperature goes down, what people do is they put salt um, of various types, like sodium chloride, table salt, or sometimes potassium chloride. And what the salt does is when you sprinkle this on the road, when it's mixed with the water, it reduces the... Um, freezing point of water so that ice doesn't form at zero degrees Celsius, but it might form, for example, maybe at negative uh, five degrees Celsius or negative 10 degrees Celsius. So in other words, the ice will form at lower temperature. And the reason why this is important is because you don't want ice all over the road, for example, because then that would make everything very slippery and driving becomes very dangerous. So the idea is to keep it as a liquid uh, or a solution in this case, and that's why the salt was added. So again, this is one of the uses of freezing point depression uh, in real life. Now, uh, we will talk about this in class, why this phenomenon occurs, why the freezing point decreases from zero degrees Celsius to negative five, for example, for water or from some temperature to a lower temperature for some other solvent. But all of these properties that we will discuss in class, including freezing point depression, will be referred to as the colligative property of solutions. So these are properties that happen or that occur in solutions for um, when you take a small amount of non-volatile solute and you mix it with a volatile solvent. We have other properties which, uh, uh, which are vapor pressure um, changes and boiling point increase. All of these will be also examples of colligative properties that we'll talk about in class. Okay, so now let's think about the specific colligative property we'll talk about, which is the freezing point depression. You can measure the decrease in the freezing point um, and then express them as the following equation, okay? It turns out that it's very easy to know how much the temperature will drop compared to the pure solvent, and that's symbolized by this um, symbol right here called delta Tf, which is just the difference between the freezing point of the pure solvent, that's the one with the degree symbol, okay? So it's called freezing point of pure solvent minus the freezing point of the solution, which is usually a smaller number. Okay, so this is after you add the solid to it. And the, that, those two things are uh, the delta Tf. This is equal to a constant Kf, which is called a freezing point depression constant. Now, the symbol Kf here has nothing to do with the formation constant that we talked about for a complex ion. This is completely a different set of constant but it's the same symbol as being used. So this is called freezing point depression constant, which depends on the solvent that you use. So water will have a specific number. 
the solvent you use in this lab, which is terodichlorobenzene, is going to have a different number. And that constant is then multiplied with small m, which stands for molality. So what exactly is molality? It's very similar to another concentration unit you're more familiar with, which is molarity. And if you remember in molarity, we take number of moles divided by volume of solution, number of moles of solute. Um, molality is almost the same. It's number of moles of solute over mass of solvent. Okay. Now for something like water, you think that this probably are very close to each other because the density of water is one gram per milliliter, which means that for every gram of um, water, you have a milliliter of water, which of, of course means that these two numbers are pretty similar, the volume and the mass, okay? But depending on what you use for solvent, this number might not necessarily be the same. The question then is, why do you use molality as opposed to molarity? Well, volume, which is the denominator in molarity, sometimes changes at higher temperature or higher pressure. So volume, as it turns out, doesn't stay constant. So in other words, if you have a particle, a number of particles, and you change the pressure, the volume of that particle collection might actually change. However, mass is a constant. It doesn't change. So if you have a mass of, for example, one kilogram at a certain temperature and pressure, that mass is going to stay the same whether you change the pressure and temperature. Okay. So as a result, um, a lot of times people are, in certain applications, prefer to use molality because the denominator, which is mass, doesn't change in this case. So just like molarity is defined as one molar being equal to one mole of solute over one liter of solution, molality is also defined where one molal is equal to one mole of solute over one kilogram of solvent. So, for example, if your solute is sugar, one molal sugar is going to be one mole of sugar over, in this case, if you dissolve it in water, one kilogram of water. Now, earlier I mentioned that freezing point depression can be used to help us in practical situations, for example, when you spread salt on icy roads that would reduce the freezing point of water and as a result the road doesn't ice up. However, a more classical use of freezing point depression is to determine molar mass of an unknown solute. So the idea here is that let's say you've synthesized, so you've made a new compound and one of the first things you want to do is determine its molar mass. Uh, freezing point depression can be used as a technique to help you figure out the molar mass of your new compound. And how do you do that? Well, remember that I gave you this equation earlier, which is that the change in the freezing point is equal to a constant times molality. Okay? But, of course, molality is just number of moles of solute over mass of solvent. So if you've made a new solute, an unknown solute, you can figure out its number of moles based on what um, freezing point depression you observe. For example, if the solute, if you put a certain amount of solute and you see a decrease of 10 degrees or 5 degrees, that automatically tells you that there's a certain number of moles of solute. Why is that useful? Well, number of moles is mass over molar mass. So in other words, I can rewrite this equation as molar mass equals to mass of solute, which is something you control, right? You know how much solute you put in, divided by its number of moles, which you can calculate based on the delta TF equation, okay? So if you know the number of moles of solute, then you should be able to um, calculate the molar mass, and that tells you the molar mass of your unknown that you just made. So in this particular lab, the solvent that you're going to use is not water, but it's something called PDB, which stands for para 
dichlorobenzene. Okay, so that's where the letter letters PDB come up in. And the structure of PDB looks like this. It's a benzene uh, aromatic compound. It has two chlorine. That's why it's called dichloro. And they're in what we refer to in organic chemistry as a para position, 1,4 position. The solute in this case will be an unknown. It will be given to you in a bio. And your goal is to figure out what is the molar mass of the solute by making freezing point measurements to see how much decrease in freezing point you observe as you add more solute. And I'll talk about more about how to do that in the next video.